in, I guess it was 2005, uh, to my considerable surprise, I was asked to be the director of the Venice Biennale. I was surprised because a native-born American has never been asked before. I tried to think about what kinds of exhibitions should be made uh, around the Biennale, what kind of exhibition I should make. And in the mix of that, thought about, well, if I'm the first American to do this, there will be a lot of thoughts about the Americanness of whatever I do. And if I were to pick an American, artist that I was proud of and that I thought represented positive things, who would that artist be? Not a single person to represent everybody because that's impossible, but somebody who would be a touchstone. Although there's no argument that uh, as a painter, Pollock had profound influence and also beyond painting. He was the father of installation art and performance in some ways too. Or that Andy Warhol has profound influence. The person that seemed to me who had really the most was John Cage. Cage was a cosmopolitan man. He worked in multiple mediums, and he had attitudes that influenced art in every domain. Cage is an artist Richter first encountered in the early 1960s while a student at the Düsseldorf Academy in the context of a Fluxus Festival that was convened more or less by Joseph Boyce. Far and away the most compelling of anybody was Cage, who, if I recall, uh, performed a piece where he wrote uh, with the microphone attached to the pen, so the sound of the pen moving on the surface of the paper was what you heard. Cage, it seems to me, was, was a reference for Richter of a kind of avant-garde practice that he himself didn't follow, but that he respected and that he could learn from. Some years later, a friend of Gerhardt's, who was also a friend of John's, um, took John to see an exhibition of Gerhardt's work. Uh, and uh, what was on display included one of the very large gray paintings that looked like they're finger painted almost, with lots of non-directional lines and squiggles and so on, and took a wonderful picture of John standing with his sort of uh, beatific smile uh, in front of one of Richter's paintings. So although Richter and Cage didn't ever meet, uh, in a sense, Richter saw him on stage but never encountered him, uh, Cage encountered Richter's work but never met him, Although they never meet, met, there was this kind of uh, charge current going back and forth. Something else that's been said, which is uh, I did not know until just recently, was that he was also thinking when painting about the Israeli bombardment of Beirut during the most recent wars between Israel and Lebanon. And that puts a whole different cast on what those pictures might be. When I wrote the book, I used analogies that were essentially landscape analogies for describing this. But that was not because I think in any way these are landscape pictures. It's because uh, the natural environment is the only uh, source that occurred to me then anyway that would provide the metaphors to describe particular textures and particular colors and particular ways in which the surfaces of those paintings move. But if you put them all together, if there is in the background of a lot of his abstractions, um, a response to nature, but not the desire to represent it in any romantic or, or naturalist way. If there is in the back of his thinking a response to Cage and to the idea of a composition which comes about without normal kinds of intentionality and that respects accident, chance, uh, the things that happen in the process of doing something, such that in making these paintings, Richter paints and paints and paints and then chooses to stop. And if in the background, the harshness of some of these paintings, the, the, the surfaces that are, uh, that are scored, the intensity of the color also suggests violence at some level. And that violence correlating to the news of the fighting in, in Lebanon. If all of those things sort of come together, then I think you have a, a relatively good idea, if you will, of how an artist of Richter's caliber is never influenced by anything, but feeds on everything uses everything. A friend of mine uh, once said that a genius is somebody who, rather like a really good engine, burns clean. Uh, there's no residue. And in, in, in Richter's case, I think that's actually true. Uh, he uses everything, and there is no residue. Uh, and, and, and in this case, what no residue means is there is ultimately no uh, single referent. There's no single thing that ties the immediacy of the painting back to something that is not as immediate as the painting. 
So it may uh, help to think about these points of reference, but the painting is not about them, never was. Uh, and where the painting will take you is not confined to those references either, because the kinds of thoughts that occur, the kind of uh, phenomenological experiences that occur, and the subject matters, the moods, the, the, the tensions, uh, are way beyond any particular subject matter. If you think about it, uh, Richter is a very methodical painter. And he's developed his method gradually, but he's very consistent in his application of it. A lot like Saul Lewitt, he's consistent in his application of it precisely in order to create results that are not repetitive. Uh, he starts in the same place, plus or minus a particular uh, ingredient or variable. He has made many series of paintings by this time. He's made many paintings by the process of uh, application, uh, scraping back or erasure of paint. Uh, he's done lots and lots of things, but each one of them has a particular tenor, has a particular scale, and so on. Now, the format that he's used for the cage paintings is a format he's used before. He's done four, and he's done more, actually, in some cases. But the particular number of these paintings uh, is, to my knowledge, unique at this format and with this surface and so on. And, for example, the Bach paintings to which these were juxtaposed when the abstract show was done in Cologne. And it was very, very interesting to see this contrast. Um, because the Bach paintings are, comparatively speaking, suave and atmospheric, whereas these are gritty and they crackle. Um, and they do actually have the sort of visual equivalent of the sound that, uh, that Cage was always after, which was the sound of the prepared piano, this kind of percussive uh, uh, t audio texture rather than audio uh, atmosphere. The Cage paintings are also intact as a group, which is not true of many of his series. Increasingly, he's able to place uh, bodies of work in their entirety, but this has only happened within recent years, and many of his series have to be reconstituted in bits and pieces. I frankly think also the cage paintings, even with, with the Beirut Association, it has a kind of lift to it. I mean, some of the greens are strange, uh, the, the reds and grays can be very, very harsh, but there is a kind of uh, openness to those paintings the surfaces are also opaque. I mean, the, the words betray me in a way, but I anyway, when I walked into that room for the first time, felt a kind of lift from them. Uh, and I think uh, Richter is after a kind of exaltation uh, in paintings in general, has been looking for that, but has always denied himself the easy ways to it. He didn't want to be Rothko. Uh, he wanted to be Newman. And Newman is a painter of transcendence whose paintings are, oddly enough, rather clunky, a lot of them, and unforgiving. Uh, and Richter's paintings are never clunky, but they're quite often unforgiving. So it's as if he's, he's, he's permitting himself only rarely to sort of take off with paintings, but when he does, he really flies. And I think in this group, that's actually what happens. Richter's technical innovations in this area are really remarkable, and they're the um, extension of a perception made very early on in his career. And it's a perception, actually, that almost any painter who's ever picked up a palette knife makes that uh, when you scrape a painting to remove a passage that you don't like, or when you scrape paint off your palette and then wipe it off, it makes this schmear where all the colors mix. And if the colors are relatively fresh, uh, it gets a kind of wonderful optical uh, jump to it because of these accidental collisions of, of different tones and textures. Rosalind Krauss, the American art historian who uh, sees everything from a very narrow uh, American perspective, in a very art historically uh, deterministic perspective, uh, explained all of this in terms of Jasper Johns's device circle, which is a painting where uh, Johns makes uses a, a ruler to go around in a circle and spread and smear paint. Now Jasper's a great, great, great painter, but he didn't invent this, and he certainly didn't invent it for Richter. Krauss's lack of knowledge about Richter and her attempt to simply line him up with American painting in the canonical mode uh, is an indication of how much of a problem Richter has been for art history generally in this country. No, I mean, the, the, the source of that is one, that any artist will do that. And the other source is actually a painting called Liebespaar by Sigmar Polka in which there is this pop image of, of a couple and then there are these smears of paint on the side. And that single use of smeared paint in this manner antedates Richter's own use of it. Richter and Polka had the kind of relationship that Johns and Rauschenberg had. I mean, they, they, they traded things back and forth. They took from each other freely. They were intimately connected with each other's work for a very long time. Uh, in any case, Richter, when he began to uh, develop his work and uh, to, first of all, think about how to blur the image 
that was an image, originally favored uh, fan brushes and big house painting brushes, and he would drag it across the fresh paint in order to make the image spread and smear and so on. Uh, to use a palette knife is a more abrupt thing because it actually removes paint, at least in the first application. Um, and so it's much more like flaying a painting, like taking the skin of a painting off, but with a knife. But as he developed the abstract work, it became his dominant mode. It was his way of creating large spaces with enormous amounts of activity, and frankly, with an enormous amount of paint. Because if you look at paintings like the group that are in, uh, in St. Louis, January, December, November, or if you look at any number of paintings before that, you'll see uh, layer upon layer upon layer of very wet, very rich oil paint. And as the paint is dragged each time, some of it sticks and some of it doesn't. And as it's dragged again, uh, there are skips where there's no point of contact for the next layer of paint to go on. So that if you look at those paintings, what you're seeing is number one, the juxtaposition of colors that comes with one schmear. And what you look at again the second time or perceive is that every place where you actually see from the top surface down into a crevice, you're also getting the mixes of colors that are down there. It's almost like they're in a canyon and you can see this stuff firing off layer by layer by layer all the way up to the surface. And it's an extraordinarily efficient way to create an incredible amount of accidental imagery or accidental optical incident. And as with Cage, Cage used to say, you know, uh, the thing about accidents is you do choose the ones you want to keep. It's not like there's no intention whatsoever. The process of arriving at a result is a process you set in motion almost blindly. Uh, the part that's not blind is the decision, once you've made something, to keep it or not. And in Richter's case, that's what it's all about. And the, the numbers of layers of paint uh, have to do less with the desire to load it up and make some busy physical thing than dissatisfaction with everything that uh, was there previously. So he keeps putting it on until something happens that he can then hold on to. The one other, I think, crucial part of this has to do with uh, uh, his relation to painting uh, of the 1940s, 50s, and early 60s that we call abstract expressionist or FOML. The general tendency at that time was, number one, to use brushes, and number two, to associate the brush mark with some kind of direct transmission through the artist's hand of an emotional content or a structural intention or what have you. And then to couple that or link all of that with a kind of signature mark, that thing that only that hand would do. And so when we look at a de Kooning or we even look at Pollock dripping, you know, the, the, the old rules of connoisseurship come in. You know, that is, that is Pollock's mark, that's de Kooning's mark, or that's Fautrier's mark, or that is Schumacher's mark, or whatever the case might be. All of that has to do with the brush or what the uh, Cicadas, who was the Mexican painter who was against this kind of art, also said, the stick with hairs on it. What Richter has done, basically, is to reintroduce the gesture without gesturalism, to use a tool that makes it impossible to make a signature mark, unless, of course, you think a broad sweep of, you know, sort of moving lava-like paint is a mark. So he's able to surface the work, to create movement within the work, without, for the most part, allowing the hand itself to be the protagonist, much less the artist whose hand that is. The only exceptions to this would be those paintings where he then takes the end of a brush and scores things and makes you know, marks within it, often, I think, just to expose the hidden layers at a certain point of the painting. There you begin to get a little bit the, the idea of gesturalism as it was practiced before. But by and large, it's this other thing. It's this, it's this process, it's this uh, willingness to let go of certain kinds of control in order that other things happen.